Um, one of the great privileges and honours of this place um, and of this society is that every once in a while we get to welcome in some truly extraordinary individuals. Um, and four years ago, we welcomed one of the most extraordinary individuals of all, um, Professor Stephen Hawking. Um, it was to be one of his final uh, public appearances. Um, and it was something that I think at the Union we have held very dear to us for, um, ever since. Um, Professor Hawking's legacy of an infectious enthusiasm for education, for science, and for uncovering some of the world's wonders is something that we take incredibly seriously uh, at the Cambridge Union. And so we established the Professor Hawking Fellowship to honour someone each year in the Michaelmas term who has contributed in perhaps not comparable scale, but in similar ways each year in a different form, in a different kind of way, some, something to the wonder of science and to education. Um, and this year, given what we have seen over the last 12 months, um, I could not think of some, someone more appropriate, more deserving of this year's Hawking Fellowship uh, than Professor uh, Dr. Kathleen Carrico. Um, for all sorts of reasons, for your work that must have saved incalculable life years um, in terms of the positive human impact that we've seen so directly um, since the beginning of this pandemic, to the extraordinary opportunities um, that it may afford us in the future, as I hope that we'll get to uncover um, across the rest of tonight's lecture. Um, you are an extraordinarily uh, deserving recipient of the Hawking Fellowship, and I'm extraordinarily proud on behalf of the Cambridge Union uh, that Lucy Hawking uh, tonight will be awarding it to you. So um, we have the certificate here um, and some sort of photo op. It's so I have to go <laughs> Now, the plan of action for tonight is roughly uh, this. Uh, Dr. Carrico has um, a lecture uh, to deliver, uh, to talk about her work and her life and her career. Um, and then we'll come into a bit of an audience Q&A. So you have about 35, 40 minutes to sit here and think of a few questions, and then we should go into that. So, Dr. Carrico, thank you. So thank you very much for this nice introduction. Uh, dear member of the Cambridge Union, professors, students, guests, colleagues, fellow scientists. I am deeply honored to be named the fifth Professor Hawking Fellow. I am humbled with a sense of deep gratitude to receive this tremendous distinction. I did not have the privilege meeting Professor Hawking the extraordinary scientist he and admired by so many. I am thanking the nomination committee of the Cambridge Union for selecting me to receive this award. I am very grateful to all who helped me to my journey to here. My family, my teachers, my mentors, fellow scientists, and I thank all of them for the inspiration and the support. This is a wonderful place here. I am humbled. And I am telling you today about my winding road, which brought me here. Uh, I was here. You don't remember me, 1977. Uh, I was 22 years old and I was a student uh, in Hungary. And first time in my life, I could get a passport to see what is behind the Iron Curtain. I was on the other side. And uh, so I selected UK to come here. And uh, I get this uh, student passport and uh, I came here to Cambridge. I visited Oxford. Both places is a big rain, so I do not remember exactly which place was Oxford and Cambridge, but in Windsor there was the sunshine and I was uh, so happy. And so it was very important for me to see. And I, I almost remember every day of that uh, three weeks uh, stay. I came back 35 years later. Of course, I never thought that as a Hungarian, student, I'm coming first, that I will come back 35 years later, rooting for the US 
team and the Olympics because my daughter was rowing in it. And you see, she got a gold medal. And this was her second Olympic gold medal. She got one in China. So, so it was a very important uh, gathering here. And then I am here again for this very important uh, uh, presentation. And uh, so I am coming rarely here, but when I'm coming, there is a good reason to come. <laughs> I want to tell you that, as I mentioned, I was coming from Hungary. So there is in the middle of nowhere, there is in a small town, Kisú Szállás. And uh, 10,000 people live there. And uh, it's a very quiet little town. And I was raised there. My parents, my father was a butcher, my mother was a bookkeeper. With my sister, we had a very happy life there. That's, you can see on the uh, left uh, that the uh, house had a uh, reed roof, uh, adobe house, and uh, no running water, no television, no, you know, so many things I can say. But it is, we didn't know happiness was there. And I've had a very happy childhood. You see, in my kindergarten, I was a butterfly there. <laughs> so I studied here, and um, my teachers were excellent and uh, encouraged us, and my parents also. My parents learned, from my parents, I learned, uh, you know, that hard work is way of life. And um, uh, I studied uh, in elementary school and high school. We had a beautiful building there, and my teacher, Albert Toth was um, inspired many scientists as from the student get the doctor scientists because he kept all interesting uh, topics for us and we uh, talk about Lombroso idea we sent letter to Shea and uh, uh, Saint Georgi and uh, they responded and we get so inspired when we get letter from his Hungarian uh, scientists who lived abroad, that uh, immediately we started to follow what they were doing. And I mentioned here to you is uh, Hans Scheyer, because um, I had no religious upbringing, so he was the guide for me uh, in my life uh, later on, and why I could insist and keep on doing things, because uh, this um, scientist, uh, found you know, and investigated the stress. And um, uh, I mentioned that, uh, believe or not, but you need stress. If you don't have stress, you don't even get up in the morning. There is no inspiration, nothing. So you need stress. But he said that the stress hear you, but not really the stress, but how you perceive. So he encouraged that you have to uh, convert the bad stress to good stress. So how you can do it, and so let's say when you are fired, it happened to me several times, then I was thinking about the new opportunity. And, um, and he also said that do not look at uh, uh, things which you cannot change. So you, you are a student and, and you might see that the others is not working that hard. Maybe they, he promoted or she promoted and she get more salary. And do not do that. Immediately you take away your attention, you cannot change that. Uh, you take away your attention from what you cannot change, then you are lost. You have to focus on what you can change. And I don't know how many times later in America I was just standing there, you know, uh, demoted and whatnot, and, and I just said, I have to think about the better experiment. Uh, the bench is here, I am in America, where else I can do these things? And uh, so you have to focus on. Things. And of course, you have to enjoy what you are doing because then you will be very good at that. And other things I might say here also that you have to believe yourself. Probably if you are here, you believe yourself. But for a Hungarian girl, you know, going to America was looking at this, uh, like University of Pennsylvania, all of these smart people are there. And I, you know, I couldn't learn here in this high school English because nobody was teaching. You can hear my accent, and, but um, you know, you go there and you can in, be intimidated. Maybe you are not the guys who can be, but I, I was like that, and I has, have to constantly say that, you know, maybe, you know, those very smart people, but 
And uh, how could I think about something they don't? But I, I said that, oh, why not? And so I tried to encourage myself that, you know, maybe I would think about something they don't. So that's a message from Shea, who wanted to have a little stress, but positive stress. So this was important for me. So uh, from, from the small town, I moved to the uh, southern part of Hungary, is Szeged. There is a university of Szeged. I studied there five years, excellent teachers. We learn everything. Like in these days, like in America, I can see that learning more and more from less, less, less and less. And finally, you will learn everything from, you will learn, you will know everything from nothing, yeah? Now it is the opposite was here. You have to know plants and do every chemistry and so, and so kind of a polyhistor we, uh, was, we were created, but the teachers were very good and I benefited deeply that what they taught us. In the same time, there was this uh, biological research center in Szeged next to the uh, university and at the dormitory I lived. And we started to work there. As a student, I already went to the laboratory. And later, I did all of this work for my PhD as well in this city and in this. So accidentally, I started to work in the lipid laboratory because one of the teachers said that I should go there. Of course, everybody said, isn't that lipid is so boring? Everybody was interested in genetics. but. I was uh, working with lipids, and uh, Professor Farkas was the head, and, and uh, Eva Kondoroshi and Ernie Duda was the young guys, and, and they wanted to uh, isolate uh, lipid, phospholipid, from the co-brain. And in that time, you know, that he went to the slaughterhouse, came back with the brain, and we started to isolate because we needed a phospholipid to make liposome. And uh, they were very revolutionary. I just, uh, retrospect, I know that in that time, in the end of 70s, to deliver DNA, and I participated in the work, we delivered DNA to the mammalian cells with liposome. So this was very important, and that's what, it was not the first experiment I did in my life, because in high school we did kind of uh, little uh, plant experiments, but this is defined why I later I came back and tried to deliver RNA. Um, lip, after the lipid lab, this was an undergraduate student, I went to the RNA lab. Again, once Steve Jobs said that only looking backwards you can link the dots, how much the RNA and lipid belongs together. At that time it was not uh, well known, and my professor, Thomas, he actually made uh, uh, cap analogues, which you can buy for a couple of dollars now, but at that time, in the middle of 70s, the person uh, who discovered the cap, uh, Aaron Shotkin in New Jersey, had, to, had a reference material, and all of my colleagues were organic chemists, so they synthesized these nucleotides and sent to there so they can see what it is. So when I went there, everybody was talking, I don't know if you are some biology scientist there, so the cap is G, P, P, G. And everybody was G, P, 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 G. I went there and I, <laughs> that was my first experience in this RNA lab. My colleague Ludwig Janusz, a uh, graduate student together, again, I can tell you how important. Even today, I am asking advice from him. So you students have to look at the, those who are sitting next to you or studying with you, because you have to follow what they are doing, be nice to them, and when, you know, they will be your colleagues and you can learn from them. Yeah? So make sure that uh, uh, you have a good connection with the student. So we were working in this RNA lab, but we didn't do long RNA. It was uh, early 80s. Uh, we did a two prime, five prime linked oligoadenylates. We did synthetically, we did enzymatically, and, um, and this was an antiviral compound. Ian Kerr in the National Institute uh, in uh, the London, he, he discovered that this is responsible for uh, uh, interferon-induced antiviral effect. And so we made these molecules and uh, tested out that whether we get uh, good antiviral effect and so on. 
And uh, somehow we ran out of money in Hungary, so I had to cross the ocean and went to Temple University. Professor was also interested in this uh, kind of uh, antiviral molecules because we thought that we need one. And you know that this is, this is why I'm talking is, is in the early 80s. And we still don't have a good antiviral complaint even today. And uh, so we were doing these uh, experiments also in the uh, United States. And, um, and then happened again, I lost my job. And so then I decided that now I, I will do RNA. So during this uh, time while I was working in this small molecule, many things happened in the RNA field. 1961 was uh, discovered, and uh, in 78, we already uh, know that mRNA was delivered inside the cells, and um, already uh, by wish in a tube, RNA could be synthesized. Yeah? So I just mentioned here importance because uh, uh, Sidney Brenner is right here from Cam Cambridge, and he was very uh, important discovering. Uh, uh, messenger RNA that exists. And of course, uh, Bohr's title has that it is a uh, labile. Of course, this is even, even today when you know that the RNA vaccine is minus seven, the RNA is labile. And uh, so that's a problem or also in an advantage because we don't want to make a spike protein rest of our life. So um, after discovering uh, RNA, of course, it was important that finally we get the answer that how from the DNA a protein, how it is made. Because in, in, for a time, they could not find uh, that um, you know, the DNA was not in the uh, ribosomes where the protein is produced. So this elusive uh, RNA was identified by these scientists. The beginning, they identified, but they could not make it. So we couldn't make RNA, so we just could isolate. And uh, people isolated from reticulocyte. This reticulocyte is differentiated and became red blood cells. So they are full of globin uh, mRNA. And uh, scientists put in a liposome. Just what we did in Hungary, they put in a liposome and then they fused the uh, cell. And then they found that um, the protein is translated in this mammalian RNA. So 1978, which I considered first time mRNA was delivered, mammalian cells, and the coded protein was detected. So, and uh, that, you know, it was just one kind of RNA could be isolated. So, uh, to make on your wish any kind of RNA, when you want to investigate any kind of protein, so there comes, uh, you know, Douglas Mellon and uh, Paul Krieg, and they, uh, come up with that uh, phage uh, uh, RNA polymerase can be used uh, to make uh, from a plasmid if it had the sequence. They selected uh, uh, interferon and uh, they inserted there and, um, and they, the, when they made the uh, uh, RNA injected to a uh, frog oocyte. Those who are very young here won't remember that once upon a time the genetic institute all you went in and you always see a, a frog there because in the terrarium because they needed frog eggs. It was easy to work with. So uh, they cultured the frog egg, which was injected with RNA, and they showed that the protein was uh, functional. So this was the first time that it was a tube they made the RNA, and actually almost the same way we are doing today, even for the vaccine. And I have to tell you that this was in the beginning of the heydays when you ask, and I personally ask Paul Krieg for the, this plasmid to make it easier in my life, and there was not sent email, it was a letter was sent, and sent back the plasmid without MTA, no material transfer agreement, which takes like a week to file and two weeks to wait. So it was when everything happy and easy. And... Uh, so I was um, 89, you know, when after I ended up in uh, demoted from and removed some position, I ended up in Penn and started to work also with RNA. And first in cardiology, you know that the molecular biologists can be anything. Later I became neurosurgery part, so that and molecular biologists can work. The molecules is everywhere, is the same. So I, we were interested in urokinase receptor, 
which was uh, participating in uh, um, uh, binding the urokinase and uh, making the uh, blood vessel patent because no coagulation. And um, I delivered this uh, RNA, I made, cloned. At that point, if you had a cell which had uh, expressed the protein and you were interested in, you just um, uh, isolated the RNA, you RT-PCR and uh, cloning, TA cloning, you get uh, the plasmid in uh, two hours, you get the RNA, you put the RNA on the cell, 10 minutes later or 15 minutes later, you already could see the protein. So it was so magic. You could do anything, and it was because all of the technology, the PCR machine, you, you know, you might say, yeah, it's always there. But in 89, you could first purchase. So everything in the end of the 80s, just everything was all of a the sudden there. So I was doing first for um, cardiology, then I uh, demoted and lost the position, and then I went to neurosurgery. Uh, because uh, they gave me a laboratory uh, and uh, I started to work there. We tried to make, uh, so, so in case the RNA is not the drug, but the RNA code for a protein is the drug, or the RNA code for an enzyme which makes something like, in our case, it was the nitric oxide synthase, which we focus, which is a gas for millisecond half-life. So uh, I was focusing on to treat uh, 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 subarachnoid hemorrhage for patients that, of course, in animal model. So doing many things, 10 years, and I never noticed that uh, the RNA I am making is inflammatory. I had to meet uh, Drew Weissman at the Xerox machine where I went to the other department because I had the password there, and, uh, and then I met this guy, mentioned that he's working on vaccine, and uh, he just came from... Uh, Anthony Fauci's lab. I didn't know who was Anthony Fauci because television, he was not every day on. So, <laughs> so uh, I offered uh, Drew that I can make RNA because he was trying to use the human dendritic cells uh, and, and try to make, but uh, he was uh, using DNA protein and did not work very well. And he came back very happily when I made this uh, get specific uh, HIV specific product. That it is a great, it is so inflammatory, it is so, it, it is adjuvant, it coats a lot of protein. But uh, I was uh, very disappointed because I want to use the RNA for therapy. And uh, you know, the stroke patient, the last thing they would need some inflammatory molecule I would put there. So we started to think why why this uh, happened and. And uh, the RNA we have inside our cells is uh, not inflammatory, is it? Because it is inside, so we decided that we have to take out cells from the cell, different compartment, and see that now that if we put to the uh, immune cells, whether the immune cells will say, oh yeah, this is inflammatory. So that's what the experiment we're doing. And uh, uh, what, we happen, what happened is that we could see that, uh, you know, the purple is there, the, uh, what I made, the RNA, which was in vitro, but uh, in the blue, you can see different uh, places we isolated RNA, and they were a little bit immunogenic, and the tRNA there is, was not. And um, uh, we know that uh, tRNA, this is a transfer RNA, is, uh, has a lot of modified nucleosides, and 25% of the nucleoside is modified, and, and so we realized that maybe we have to somehow put, put this modification on the MAM RNA and, and maybe our RNA will be not immunogenic. But this comes to the question, how we should do that? Nobody has done that before. And in nature, you have enzymes. So every time you make the RNA, your body is always a four basic nucleotide. And when you made the RNA after different enzymes, and uh, I just want to scare you with this uh, slide that it has a lot of structure, but you know, more than 100 uh, modification in the RNA. And uh, enzymes, not, not that they were not commercially available, <laughs> they were not known. So we cannot do how nature is doing. So we had to come up with a solution that we will purchase already modified nucleotides and try to, you know, make sure that maybe the or uh, rooting for that enzyme that it will incorporate. Uh, yeah, at the 10, we purchased five 
incorporated, and uh, we could make already at least five. Yeah? And uh, so the question came that not whether these are immunogenic. You know that, guys, how many times I ask that I wish I would be older one week, because by that time I would know the result. Because, <laughs> and uh, yes, and uh, we thought that we have the answer, but usually we get 10 more questions, but that's another <laughs> question. Okay, so what we discovered is uh, some of the modification was uh, suppressing immunogenicity. We tested out in isolated dendritic cells and it was not immunogenic. And uh, when we looked at closer, we found that when uridine was modified, then the RNA was not immunogenic. Who knew that, you know, that the uridine, the, our body in the immune cells is recognizing the uridine out of the mRNA and then makes it. So that, that was a good, good news, no, that I was just rooting that, I oh, hope that uh, it will be also translatable because this uh, elaborates something maybe there and uh, maybe we, the modified uh, nucleotides will code for a different amino acid and then we were, we were not too happy about. But luckily that uh, translation in some of them occurred and this orange shows that in pseudouridine, which is a modified urine, it is 10 times more protein we, we could uh, generate. Of course, we were immediately anxious that to show that it will work in animal and hope for that maybe human it will work. So did, we did an animal experiment. And here, erythropoietin coding mRNA was made. And uh, erythropoietin is uh, stimulating uh, red blood cell production. And uh, we could find in the red shows that when uh, pseudouridine was incorporated to the RNA, four days, the animal continuously made erythropoietin we could detect in the blood. And in the middle section, you can see that this RNA was not immunogenic in the mice. And when we injected, it was the protein was functional because the hematocrit increased in the animal. And when we weekly injected, we could maintain high hematocrit in the animal. And so we established company, we filed patent, we, we demonstrated that, um, and we wanted to use for for anemia, because if somebody has anemia, maybe their kidney problem, then this erythropoietin could be done anywhere. It was injected sub-Q, intramuscular, any place, and the made uh, EPO was functional. So there is another encounter with uh, Ugur Zahin. And again, accidentally, I learned about BioNTech. You might heard this name, but at that time, when 2013, BioNTech had no website. Somebody said that they have some uh, RNA trial, and I decided that the nucleoside modified RNA has to be put in, uh, you know, the, uh, testing. And they had human trial. I don't mention that uh, I had a little push out from, from the university as well, so that's coming together, and then I found a good place to go. And uh, again, seeing the positive side, what um, uh, when you unwanted another place, maybe you wanted an, uh, another place. So that's, and here I show just an uh, experiment where we use uh, bispecific antibodies and uh, the messenger RNA code for a protein, which one part is see the tumor, the other see the, uh, see the uh, uh, T cells and it brings together and then uh, the, this kind of messenger RNA injected to the mice and eliminates two more. So we did uh, many experiments here. Meanwhile, my colleagues uh, back in the uh, University of Pennsylvania were working on vaccine because that was uh, Drew Weissman and colleagues were uh, interested in vaccine. And um, they, 2012, identified this uh, uh, lipid nanoparticle which has uh, four different uh, components and uh, it could be made in particle with the RNA. And the importance was that now that this uh, RNA with this particle has shelf life, so that you can put in a minus 70, and we took out uh, every year from the one aliquot for five, six years, and it was identical. If you injected the animal, same effect. So it means that when it was this kind of uh, product was uh, kept in uh, this kind of uh, lipid, then it is uh, very stable. And um, so they're working in the, at the University of Pennsylvania. Here is uh, Norbert Party. Actually, he happened to come from the same town, Kishu Salas. You already know the name. 
And his grandfather and my father worked in the same butcher shop. So it was a close relation. And uh, he remembers that when I visited my mo mother home, you know, that he, he came and uh, in the kitchen we were sitting and I said this word, pseudo Yuridin. He first time heard his, this name and he remembered and he came to Penn. He finished the same, he graduated the same university I did. So he was doing these studies and they developed um, a vaccine against Zika virus. This was, you know, in the um, uh, 2015, it was an important uh, uh, virus that we needed targeted. And uh, here he selected only one part, again, from this virus, which is on the surface, because that will generate neutralizing antibodies. And uh, he generated one methyl pseudouridin containing RNA from the envelope coding protein envelope uh, coding for the envelope and then uh, uh, made this uh, particle. He tested out in mice and here shown in monkeys and even very small dose which was like 50 microgram, I don't know who works in laboratory knows that it's a very small amount, which uh, was effective in mice and effective was monkeys. So it didn't have to scale up, that is an animal, you know, the monkeys is bigger than the mice, so didn't have to scale up. And uh, when it was the animal was challenged uh, with the uh, Zika virus, it, it uh, provided protection. And uh, so that was very important finding. And, and then we did, uh, and they did there you know, with Drew Weissman and Norbert Paddy, did the additional experiment. They did uh, influenza, uh, herpes simplex, um, HIV, and uh, tested out all, all of these vaccines, and all of them were so well. So we were just so nervous and, and so ready, you know, that this positive uh, uh, stress is coming, that you want to make sure that uh, something is happening that you try to work on. And uh, so these studies all were uh, actually performed here, but together, when this paper was published, uh, Moderna, a company in, uh, you already know about, I don't have to say. So Moderna was did also the same time they published Zika, same uh, one methyl pseudouridin LMP, and they get uh, similar data. And they also started clinical trial and so on. So this is where we have now. That's how we get to the present uh, vaccine, which was developed by BioNTech and Pfizer, and of course Moderna is similarly. And, uh, it was uh, the information became available for the, for the uh, corona in January. And uh, as uh, uh, this year, August, we already have a fully approved mRNA product, uh, the vaccine. And uh, if you listen to the news, you already know that on Friday, uh, five to 12 years old, is, uh, can be vaccinated in the United States uh, as an emergency approval to get this uh, vaccine. I don't say too many things because maybe, uh, you know, every day people followed what happened uh, with the vaccine when the test was ending. And uh, so I was very happy that uh, I was part of it. And, uh, uh, and, uh, Together with all of these people I just uh, mentioned, and I have their, their references, who worked here in Cambridge, who work in France and all over, who discovered the RNA, who uh, developed for different, uh, and did all of the uh, experimentation, and uh, all of these people contributed. In my, myself, I was hoping that, um, that one person I was working in a, in a different project at uh, BioNTech, and this was for um, uh, making the cold uh, tumor hot by injecting mRNA coding for cytokines. And I just hoped that uh, when uh, this entered clinical trial one and a half years ago, that at least uh, one person will benefit. And I was waiting and still remained in Germany because I didn't mention that I lived in the United States. I just commuted to uh, Germany. Uh, and I spent there like 10 months in a year. And with, uh, when we went there originally with my colleague Hiromi Muramatsu, who, who was just came to Japan, he also left family, children behind, and we were on a mission to BioNTech. We will introduce this modified RNA and worked 
really um, weekends and even I was hired as a uh, vice president. I bled the mice uh, during the week and taking samples and so. And um, myself is, um, when I was University of Pennsylvania at age 58, I still worked with my own hands. I did uh, pour the gel and the samples, uh, pick up the materials, uh, sometimes cleaned and defrosted the freezer. And, uh, and so every, every kind of work and had a lot of experience with that. And I appreciate if somebody else is doing. And uh, so um, at that point, uh, life I never had one or two years ahead of me to know that I have salary so but that is a double-edged sword because if you have all of the money and the tenure maybe you sit back and you don't work so that little stress maybe you need <laughs> and um, so with that uh, I thank you for your attention and uh, I hope that I left enough time for questioning Well, um, Dr. Kerrigan, I have plenty of questions after that, but I'm aware that there must be all sorts of questions from the room as well. So I'll go there first. Does anyone have any questions? If so, please raise your hand. There's one over there. Can we get a microphone around that way? Um, yeah. So thank you so much for that talk. It was really interesting. I was just going to say here in the UK and in other countries in the world, we're incredibly lucky to have ample supply of vaccine. However, in many other parts of the world, they still don't have enough mRNA, enough of any vaccine. and They're still currently suffering with large burdens of COVID. How do you feel about companies um, that aren't giving vaccine to countries that aren't privileged enough and countries that um, don't have the money? How do you feel that they're basically, you, the UK and other countries are just hoarding vaccines for themselves at the moment? I mean, I, I cannot comment uh, what the uh, UK is doing because I, tomorrow I have to leave the country. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, uh, beside that, so I, um, when, when we realized that this RNA is a good one, with the Duvais one, we decided that we, we do not want to license at all, because we want to, everybody to use it. And then they say that nobody will invest anything if you don't uh, license, because they have to do clinical trial, pay for it, uh, other things. So that's what, you know, our feeling is with the, every, we want everybody. I think most of the people want that. So then it comes that um, what we should be rational. So that one was that, okay, we should give out the recipe and everybody can do. But I, don't, I would like everybody to get the same quality. And if you read uh, uh, the papers that um, uh, how many hundreds of uh, quality control is needed, and then even those, you know, Moderna was... Uh, just uh, use a company who produced and they had to destroy and, you know, it was bad. So that um, uh, what is required is that those people had to train who are doing. And those people who could train, they are working day and night to produce more vaccine. And so for this uh, pandemic happened that uh, the information went very well everywhere. So that's, that was the good part. Compare, you don't remember what was HIV that for, for years you, we didn't even had a test to see that positive and negative. But uh, for the production, they are thinking that uh, if different uh, part of the, like Africa everywhere would be a production facility has to be set up, but uh, it has to be sustainable. So there is no, no uh, pandemia, they had to produce something, so the technology is there, the people are there, and, and they identified that, uh, I don't know, 100 million doses, they had to such a facility, and they calculated maybe there could be five on the world that needed some kind of vaccine to produce. Of course, it would be simple if every vaccine would be RNA, because it would be one project and not making that this is killed virus and others. So, so, but everything is uh, gradually going there. And, and um, 
So the uh, distribution right now, I, I mean, uh, 150 countries, uh, uh, Pfizer is sending, and uh, and uh, if you read the uh, Wall Street Journal, uh, Albert Burla described that in many countries uh, uh, not approved, and so you cannot go there and uh, with the, that you you try to push your product on them. So that would be the best if locally would made. It it needs time. Maybe now we learned enough that uh, hopefully not pandemic is coming, but if coming that you know locally they can produce. But the facility has to be sustainable. It has to produce when it is no pandemia, so that the knowledge is there and continues. So, you know, the people are not mean, uh, and 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 they, uh, if you you would see also this uh, Pfizer, how how professional and how, I I mean I have the greatest respect. I know that people like to hate the big farm or something just because they are big, but they are doing a very good job. I don't know whether I answered your question. <laughs> Any hands maybe this time? Go to the uh, man there. Thank you, ma'am, uh, for your speech today. I think uh, we want to thank you for your service for humanity. The freedom we enjoy sitting in this room today is possible because of your invention. Uh, my question is, uh, there was a lot of skepticism about mRNA as a technology before the pandemic, but now that it's proven, we all have it, most of us in this room have it in our bodies. Where do you see uh, the mRNA technology go in the future? And uh, what are the potential areas you see its application? Yeah, so I don't know that clock is not working there. No? It's, it's Stop, okay, mission. okay. <laughs> Because sometimes time flies and okay, it's now it's not. Fun. Yeah. So uh, those who are not in the RNA field, they didn't know that actually a lot of RNA product uh, was already in clinical trial. Like uh, for heart failure was the first one. AstraZeneca started to heart failure inject to the heart during bypass surgery, and uh, increasing VGFA mRNA, increasing the uh, blood flow in uh, in the tissue of the heart. They also use this for uh, uh, necrotic uh, wound healing for the, the diabetic patient. So uh, passive immunization. Uh, Moderna had, uh, for example, for chikungunya uh, monoclonal antibody coding mRNA. And these are already were clinical trial. It is just that uh, people did not know about because uh, why should? But um, all of a sudden, everybody learned mRNA, even those who are in France, because it is backwards and it's difficult because it is ARM, and uh, they had to change. And so uh, we learned yeah, that uh, this kind of product is there. And uh, I mentioned the clinical trial already with the melanoma. I just mentioned the mRNA is coding for four different cytokines. Already in clinical trial before the pandemic happened, just uh, was not publicly known. People kind of know that uh, there are some cancer vaccine development, but those are much more challenging because, as I mentioned, for the virus, uh, Moderna and uh, uh, BioNTech, Pfizer, uh, developed the same, same target because it is obvious. That's, that is what's in the surface. And the uh, Zika virus also, but as a uh, first surface envelope, that's what you have to target. But for cancer, uh, it is more challenging. And uh, uh, three years ago, we already had a presentation on the RNA conference. I will be talking there a week from today. We are organizing from 2013, and you could hear there are companies are and, and groups are working with uh, for a uh, uh, malaria vaccine. And all of these will be, I mean, the vaccine will advance. Not all of them, let's say bacteria is uh, different because the surface is a uh, complex sugar and the uh, RNA can code for a protein, but uh, many other diseases uh, you can have. And many of them is uh, therapeutic. And, uh, you know, I couldn't get money for my own company because I am a scientist and I always say that, oh, but we cannot do everything. If I wouldn't know that much, I was, oh, RNA can do everything. So RNA with this particle or anyway, it won't go through tissues layer. It won't go through on mucus. You know, it, it, uh, 
when we deliver it, epithelial cell can pick it up. So if uh, you make a secretable protein and can circulate, that's fine, like the EPO uh, erythropoietin. But uh, uh, if you have to reach to make uh, intracellularly, you need inside the cell to specific protein to be made, you have to reach somehow that cell. And that is where the future is coming. How you wrap it up the RNA and then put something there that when you inject, that will go to, let's say, the bone marrow. And this is already advanced stage so that the, the formulation will help to not to take out the bone marrow to ex vivo in, in a dish to do like um, sickle cell anemia, but uh, you can just inject and this is much cheaper then. And um, so this is the future is also going to this direction. I know that the money is pouring there more company. Actually, even before there are companies, RNA companies in Japan, in Korea, China, even before the pandemic happened, and they are doing different projects. Some, some has good formulations, some has uh, uh, target oriented. And so more people were thinking and hopefully you go back uh, who are scientists or who is not, but it will be. And then you will uh, develop something and you will say, oh, that's simple. I just, in a, ordering a gene, for example, again, I can say if 20 years ago this pandemic happened, it wouldn't be enough, you know, to just get the, oh, this is the sequence information. You, 20 years ago, you needed in your hands to get the material. Somebody should send you. Now that you didn't need it because uh, uh, first in a German uh, scientist uh, made companies and you could order the gene they synthesize for you. And maybe you take for granted if you work there, oh, we were that already just order that but somebody did that. And, and many, many people uh, advanced uh, the technology that uh, it could be happen that uh, we know the information and, and then we can have a vaccine. That was a long answer for Michael, your short question. Can we go to the woman at the back over there? Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, I was just wondering, as an expert in the field, I'm sure you're faced with a lot of... Um, anti-vaxxers uh, anti -vaxxers and anti-vax um, arguments. I was wondering how you respond to those and how you would normally deal with those, those arguments. I, um, so I might say that um, uh, against the new technology, there, were, there was always, uh, you know, skeptic. Um, I mentioned the uh, Röntgen 100 years ago. And when he introduced... Uh, people try to see what negativity could be in and they come up with uh, that uh, the Röntgen will go through the clothes. And then here, actually, in the UK, they um, protested and they tried to submit that X-ray should not be in the binocular in the theater because they will see you naked. Yeah? And they didn't thought about that maybe it goes through the flesh and you just see the bone, but that's... Um, and. Um, and what happened is that uh, some uh, smart uh, in London come up with selling uh, X-ray resistant underwear. And so people always made money. And in the United States, they looked at the doctors who are uh, the major source of 80% uh, of this anti-vaccine. Uh, and everybody on, uh, had some product. Uh, so they, they were not anti-vaxxer because they are looking for your best interest. They want you to buy something. And so that's also is part of it. And uh, I, I honestly believe that most people honestly want to understand how this is work. And, and then if, if you ask a question which is not loaded, which already say the answer, so I don't have nothing to answer, then I explain. Or, you know, when people worried about that, oh, I read that um, uh, the RNA will go to, to my chromosome and I will left all my life, I will make it and, and explain to me that it won't happen. For me, it was that if you believe that will happen, I can explain why it won't happen, but end of it, you don't know the science and that comes down that do you believe me or do you believe the other? And so people don't know things, and then I realized also in this pandemic 
that uh, we have to do a much better job to communicate. So when the, um, uh, I give an interview and I read, the, you know, they send me and I'm, oh my God, so I said, I didn't see that, you know, because I don't express myself properly and the, and the uh, who writing the article don't know enough and ask questions. When I look at the microscope, can I see the RNA? <laughs> it is a solution, so it has to be a special microscope and special uh, staining and whatnot. So, so uh, no idea. And so we have to educate the people and many people honestly want to know, want to understand, but quickly in a bio 101 to push through them that what is the immune system, how it recognizes, and because they might learn that, oh, they recognize the foreignness or something, which is already is, everything is what we learn, what I learned in school is, is not true, not that way. It is. So uh, somehow we have to find words. And I also looked at the anti-vaxxers that how, how calm they are. They are so confident and they, they are taught that there is a style to it. You know, not, not like me, you know, I try to, too many things to say in the same time, no. So, uh, but they have an interest. And uh, so I don't know what, um, what to do. Uh, about so we have to educate the people and and uh, then there will be less will believe something which is so fake and untrue. I'd just like to ask actually um, through your your um, speech today, there were lots of times in it where you were rejected or you talked about moving on from different jobs or not being able to start the business that you wanted to start or whatever else. And what I want to know is what possessed you to keep going and to carry on and. Where did that conviction come from that you were onto something that other people weren't? Um, so, I, if you are working on any project, you can be even uh, history or something. And so, uh, every day when you are doing, you you have to enjoy the job. That's number. If if you don't enjoy, just do something else. And let's say scientists, um, if you want to make money, don't do science. <laughs> <laughs> but if you want to have fun. The rest of your life, be a scientist every day, challenge, you don't have to crossword puzzle, there will be enough puzzle there. And, um, and so every day or, you know, you have a question and, and you have to solve problems. And those are little victories, they say, student asked me, how I can be so successful as you are? Oh, ask me, uh, ten, uh, a decade ago, I would be, a, <laughs> you know, who was sent out from the laboratory. So, so it is not, not this one is, is the success is every day you go and then you solve a little problem and then you are so happy that, oh, this gel is so nice and this band is so nice. And uh, so, uh, and, and uh, you understand something how, like, now that we have to purify the RNA and nobody knows and you do that and there's so many things comes to mind and, and you succeed. And, and the, the RNA was always getting more protein from it. It was, now it's working in cells, now it's working in animals. And so you have to see progress. So otherwise that just to, because I want to like cut it, doing, doing, is, and, and every day and uh, is not going anywhere. Don't do, don't do. You have to do then change the project. But it went on and it was, and the why I could, focus this uh, share thing that uh, I did not look at uh, my colleagues and others around me, uh, you know, promote it, get everything, and I get nothing. Because I, I, I was, the bench was there. And so, so that's what you, you can keep, because otherwise you can get discouraged and you feel unfair and uh, you... And also, once my colleague introduced and said that, oh, uh, meet Kati, she works for me. I said, no, no, I don't work for you. I, I won't be coming Sunday, Saturday for Frank. I, I, I am here because I want to understand. So that's, if you take this way, even you are happy if somebody publishing the result, what you are working on, because he said, okay, I don't have to finish the experiment. I, here is the result. But if you are working to get a good CV, Oh, you are so, this, oh, I was working on it. I almost close to the result. And then others are published. And now, you know, my promotion is off. 
and so on. I, nature will not publish, and so that's horrible. Terrible. And so that's uh, what uh, it is. I, I, I mentioned I never uh, get uh, for 40 years award, and um, you know I didn't get the NIH grant, R01. This is like the you know first step to, for somebody to be uh, faculty. So anyway. Yes. Cool. Oh. Lots of questions. Um, can we go to the uh, person uh, over there? Hi, thank you so much for coming to speak to us today. Um, I've just been thinking about how a major limitation of the vaccine rollout at the moment is the fact it has to be stored at such extreme temperatures. Do you think there's any room for development in the nanoparticle technology so that it can be stored at more feasible temperatures? Uh, so, uh, I don't think that room temperature will be, because inherently you don't need the RNAs. The RNA has this extra hydroxyl there in the two prime, and so you never heard that, um, you know, dinosaur RNA was just uh, purified. It was DNA. It's much more stable. So, uh, so it, it, it won't be a room temperature, or it is room temperature, it will be a very limited time. So, the temperature you are increasing, uh, it will be uh, less less time you can store. So right now, maybe when when uh, so much is needed, you know minus twenty. But um, as I told you, minus seventy, you don't have to go through your inventory in every six months and throw away all of the sample. You don't have to throw. Just make sure that the seventy is working, and then two years later you come back and take out that vaccine. Yeah. So, uh, but um, of course now that uh, also Pfizer uh, announced that uh, higher temperature, but it's a limited, limited time. So uh, they can distribute, but they have uh, centers everywhere. And then when they uh, ship it, uh, uh, and, and whatever el electricity, you can have minus uh, 70. So if, um, you know, it would be a good investment for company or countries to buy some 70s because it will be years you can keep. And this is what actually, originally, we had only data for that uh, temperature. And uh, that's why it was, uh, because you have to submit data when you have higher temperature, you have to show that how much. And, uh, and it, uh, yeah, so, yeah. Okay, to um, person at the front there. Thank you very much for coming today. Um, really amazing, you know, speech and super inspiring. You've definitely become a role model for many young females. And we've actually seen such an amazing contribution that women have done during the pandemic. What sort of advice would you give to those young females that are thinking of getting into STEM subjects? Yeah, so, so one thing I learned uh, during this time is, uh, you know, the education of the public and the other is inspiring uh, uh, young people who you know to to do these things and and uh, i so there was an article about one of the uh, fellow who worked in our lab and then when he learned that they are talking behind me that you know kati was pushed down da, 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 and uh, he realized that i has all this idea and helping and and he realized that um, he doesn't, want, he doesn't want to be just scientist because, uh, you know, the, it is difficult to uh, maintain and the harsh treatment. So I don't want to people see that it is a suffering. I was very happy, you know, uh, doing experiment. And so that's what I want to, to, to communicate because from outside it seems like a lot of sweat and other things. But uh, it was a joy. And uh, so to have them understand that it, it is fun and, uh, and uh, have them talk to them. Because as I mentioned, uh, when uh, Sanjur, the Nobel Prize winner, you know, he responded to the letter. We sent him a letter, Albert Sanjur, the United States. And he responded. They found him. And so we were so happy and, and inspired us. And without uh, uh, sending a letter to uh, Shaya, you know, I wouldn't get this guide that, uh, you know, what I learned from him. And so I feel that I have to have this role for, because for me it was important and I should help other young, young girls. And, and in Germany I went out just 
you know, because some said that if you want to, a female scientist to be very good, you know, this um, uh, university, they invited me. And the girl said that, uh, was told that uh, you really cannot f forget about family. So, but for the Hungarian student, uh, Friday I said, for the women, if you want to be a scientist, find a good husband. <laughs> because my husband this was supportive. He, when I went weekends to, uh, you know, doing, uh, because if I go Saturday, and then I, by Tuesday, then I can get back the clone and daughter, you know, something. But he never complained that why I'm not cooking something. It's time to <laughs> forget it because uh, nobody appreciates what I'm doing. And he was supporting me to go to Germany, whereas previously he didn't cook. He could do many things, fix the car and other, but uh, not cook, but he learned cooking and um, supported me just to go. You always wanted to do that. And uh, so if you have a good husband and for the boys, good wife, that equally important than helping, uh, you know, others. My husband also has his own things, uh, you know, he's, he's happy to do and um, I am helping and we always look for that how I can help him and how he can help me. And if you have that, if you have in your family, inside the family, you have this uh, equality, sooner or later in the workplace will be also equality. Yeah, that's what I think. I think we've got time for maybe two more questions. We'll come to this uh, individual at the front and then we'll do one more. Are you vaccinated? <laughs> yes. <laughs> it was in the front of the camera. Back about having time for two more questions. I think we had time for three. Um, <laughs> Yes. Uh, we'll go to the person just at the front nearest to me there. Thank you. Thank you for your talk. It's very <laughs> inspiring. Um, my question is, how did you know RNA was the field of research you wanted to pursue? So I, I am uh, working in Bethesda in this, this time and, and I just wonder why everybody is doing this DNA. And um, uh, 1990 started the Human Genome Project when they identified the, the, some gene and they saw that, oh, that's kind of foul. And, and that's, uh, they tried to uh, introduce with the viruses and the gene therapy was in the front. And I was thinking that uh, people more likely get um, uh, acute disease, the pain and aches and burns and whatnot, and, and they would need something, uh, you know, locally overexpressed protein. And I imagine that you will have in your freezer at home RNA, and then you are cooking and burn, and then you just go there and take out the collagen 7 mRNA and put it there, and then it will heal. So that, and um, for that one, we have to have the minus uh, 20, uh, because I don't want people to get minus <laughs> 70 at home, so that uh, would be more easily. Uh, and, and you know that it is the RNA is like a regular drug. You know, you put it there and it, it helps, then you maybe reapply, but now it is healed, then you don't. So it is more like a conventional, and it is very uh, linear, so not like the DNA that, uh, you know, could be exponential and you cannot uh, control very much. More RNA, more protein. And uh, so that's, I thought that more uh, disease are there. And so I had a list of 30 things that uh, what I wanted um, to, because in 24 years uh, at the University of Pennsylvania, every week I um, restricted myself not more than two lectures because I love to go to lecture. And that was what the main uh, value I found, uh, you know, be like you are here. And so that University of Pennsylvania is an Ivy League school. So that's also, you know, some uh, big respect there. And, and uh, so that was good that they presented there. Good uh, speakers came, great science. But today you can listen to them on, a, uh, on an internet, you know, on YouTube. But um, so my thinking was that uh, more likely uh, the RNA uh, is, for example, the neuron when I was, so is a neuron is uh, far away from, uh, from the cell, cell body, like, uh, you know, two meters away or depending on how you, long your legs are. 
And then uh, at the end of the uh, end of the axons and the dendrites, there is translation. And uh, you can just locally deliver there and you can uh, translate whatever is beneficial and uh, you cannot reach the nuclei, it is so far away. So many things, I, and uh, translation, okay, not all of the cells, red blood cells not have translation, but um, all of the cells has translation ongoing. And so uh, when you deliver a DNA, and that became problem with the DNA vaccine, that it did not work, you had to inject milligrams in a human, because for that to work, the cell had to divide the nuclear membrane had to be broken up, and that not happened that way. So I thought that, okay, so the skin surface, these, uh, know it or not, these cells are dead in the, not just on me, you also. So that uh, putting a cream RNA is not working. You have to remove the upper layer and, you know, like an injury or something. Yeah. But um, so the, I, I, I just, that's what I was thinking. But when I told somebody that I work with RNA, kind of they felt sorry for me. <laughs> because uh, in the molecular biology lab, they already, uh, if you use the quietin kit, uh, you already use add the uh, uh, RNAs to re remove the uh, bacterial RNA. And then you already contaminate the whole lab. You touch the freezer, everything, and the gel apparat, and you run the samples always a smear. And the other thing also that, you know, the gloves, the people put gloves because everywhere is RNAs, and then, you know, they forget, and they put uh, the, on the skin, and then they open the tube, and they think that, you know, they have gloves, but they were at touch. I never wear gloves in a, working for that many years with RNA, because I know that that is there, and so I always care for it. So, did I answer your question? <laughs> Has anyone got... A very short question that isn't you. Some sort of largely short. We'll go there. Is this going to be quick? My answer will be short. All right, thank you for your talk. Very inspiring. Um, I, be I believe there are lots of people who did not believe in your research in the beginning. Do you have any last words for them? <laughs> I am not this kind of uh, person who, you know, this uh, redemption and uh, n not feeling like that. And, uh, and those people who cross me or something, they, they forget, they remember that they have me. And uh, I, don't, I don't confront, it's, you know, I don't um, say that, oh, you know, I, I said so, no, no, that I, no. Okay, that was short. No. <laughs> Very well done. Um, well, I think that probably ought to bring us uh, to an end tonight. I should say, before we go, um, an enormous thanks in particular to uh, TPP, who are um, the sponsors behind the Hawking uh, Fellowship Lecture, without whom... Um, events like this wouldn't be possible. So thank you very much in particular to them, first of all. But thank you especially to Dr. Carrico for a wonderful lecture and some fantastic answers. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>